Okay, welcome back, everybody. We have two more, <coughs> two more sessions to go, sorry. Uh, and uh, we're carrying on our journey, our guided tour through the Facebook engineering landscape. And we've talked about the iOS app, and we've talked about React and React Native, and we've talked about Android, and we've talked about how we try to make all that stuff really, really fast. But obviously, the front end is only part of the story. We need to go back behind the curtain to find out what happens to the data uh, that we use and create on Facebook. So this starts getting really interesting, and we start to see lots of zeros. I promise you, you will see numbers, an order of magnitude beyond maybe what you would uh, even expect. It's a very, very exciting topic. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to draw back that curtain and introduce up onto the stage uh, the team that's going to take us on that tour through the data infrastructure, starting with Sambhavi. Thanks. Thank you, James. Hi, everyone. Welcome here. I hope you all got your caffeine, ice cream. You're all set for the afternoon. We have some exciting stuff to show you here, so we, we hope you're, you know, you're equally excited to see it. I'm Sambhavi. I manage some of the data infra teams at Facebook, data infrastructure teams at Facebook. Today, me and my colleagues, Avery and Jay, are going give, to give you a behind-the-scenes view into the data infrastructure that powers insights and analytics at Facebook scale. If you are a Facebook app or a business page owner, you have likely seen and used page insights and app insights as a way to understand your users and fans. Today, we will talk about the infrastructure that powers these insights that you see. In the first part of this talk, I'll set context. I'll talk about the what and the why of data infrastructure, and then give you a peek into our history as we evolved this platform over the last eight years at Facebook to changing needs. Avery and Jay will then deep dive into two of the open source technologies that are core to our data infrastructure. Before we get into what data infrastructure is and why, why we care about it, let's actually start with the mission of Facebook. Facebook's mission is to enable people around the globe to connect and share with each other. Now, to do this, as you can imagine, our infrastructure needs to store and process large volumes of data. There's different kinds of data. There's user data, and there's log data. Let me illustrate this with an example. Up here on the screen, you can see the Facebook news feed for a user. And while it looks relatively simple, it's actually composed of data from many, many different data sources in our infrastructure. Pictures in the news feed, photos in the news feed, are stored and served from our, from our storage system that's optimized for storing blobs or photos called Haystack. Most of the per user, friend, per user information, such as friend lists, your posts, and your comments are stored and served from sharded MySQL databases, while messages are stored and retrieved from a scalable distributed key value store that many of you are likely familiar with called Edgebase in combination with MySQL as a queuing system on top. Now, all of this data that I've been talking about so far comprises what we call user data. It's the data that our users share on Facebook. So you may ask, what then is log data? When a user interacts with Facebook by uploading a photo, sending a message, sharing a post, or commenting on a post, a log event gets generated which contains information about that user interaction. This stream of log events is then transported and stored in our data infrastructure for the purposes of analytics. At Facebook Engineering, we pride ourselves on our ability to move fast. In the case of building products, in order to move fast, we need to be able to get feedback quickly on what works well and what doesn't work well on our products. This, in turn, helps us quickly iterate and be able to be able to produce awesome experiences, awesome user experiences, and engaging products for our users. And we, the, the way we get this feedback is by running analytics on the log events that I just spoke about. Sherlock Holmes said this best. Data is key 
to building great products. OK, so let's make things a little bit more concrete. In the next few slides, I'm going to walk through several examples that demonstrate the power of analytics. My first example is from the State of the Union speech by President Obama earlier this year. You might recognize these images. These are from abcnews.com. And out there on the bottom, you can see trending topics on Facebook that we aired on ABC News. In this particular, in this particular set of images, you can compare and contra contrast the top topics among men versus the top topics among women. These trending topics were generated by analyzing what people were talking about in real time on Facebook. Now for a moment, let's step back and think about the infrastructure challenges that are posed in building to our data infrastructure to build this particular application of data analytics. We have several hundreds of millions of users who are active on Facebook every day, and we have billions of posts that we see. This data infrastructure has to be able to ingest, continuously ingest that stream of posts and in real time be able to determine which of them are relevant to the speech and what topics are trending up or trending down. My second example is for the Super Bowl fans among you. Here you can see the top topics and the top brands based on post and hashtag volume on Facebook during the big game. Now, sometimes we run analytics and we see interesting or unexpected insights. For example, by running analytics, we found that just slightly less than two-thirds of our users thought that the best part of the game was the commercials, the party, and the halftime show. For more infographics on recent events, like, the super, like, like this one related to the Super Bowl, you can find them on insights.fb.com. And these infographics are derived using our data infrastructure platform as a way to run analytics. My third example is closer to home. At the beginning of this talk, I mentioned page insights and app insights as a way for business page owners and app owners to understand their users. Here you can see a screen, an image from page insights. And a Facebook business page owner can use this, use this insights application to figure out, to basically understand the demographic breakdown of their engaged fans and to, and to understand their reach. This, in turn, can help them strategize to grow their reach. This, again, is powered by our data infrastructure. And there are many, many other ways in which data and analytics is used around Facebook. I'm not going to walk through all of these examples of how we use it. But at a high level, it's used all the way from generating business page recommendations for our users to newsfeed ranking. OK, so far we've taken a look at what data infrastructure is and how it's used. I'm now going to take a step back in time. I'm going to go back to 2007 and share with you our journey as we had to evolve this platform over the years to the changing landscape for data analytics within the company. So let's go back to 2007. Back then, we used traditional off-the-shelf analytic products to answer questions like how many daily active people were on Facebook. Now, one of my colleagues, who, who was a data scientist in the company back then, tells me that it used to take over one day to process one day's worth of raw web logs using these systems. As you can imagine, that was not scalable, and we started to explore other alternatives. It was around this time that Hadoop was also gaining traction and popularity in the open source community, and so we started to adopt it and use it as our analytics platform. And at this time, we had a few tens of terabytes of data stored in, our, uh, stored in Hadoop. Now, as the years progressed, the number of users and the content shared on Facebook continued to grow at a rapid clip. And correspondingly, the usage of data infrastructure within the company exploded. By 2011, we had a sophisticated ecosystem of tools around Hadoop in Facebook. We had logging frameworks that dramatically reduced the barrier to entry for a product engineer 
who wanted to log data into our data warehouse. We built an open sourced hive, which was an easier way to express your computation. You could now write SQL-like statements instead of having to write MapReduce programs. And I'm sure all of you who have used Hadoop would agree that this is far simpler. And we built tools to aid the creation of dashboards to visualize the data and, to create, and, and tools to enable creating daily data pipelines on top of Hadoop. So this is a map of our data infrastructure from 2011, putting all of this together. And around this time, we had a few tens of petabytes of data stored in the warehouse, stored in Hadoop. So we had three orders of magnitude more data than we had back in 2007. Fast forwarding to today, our size and scale is now huge. We have over 600 terabytes of data that we ingest every day into our analytics platform, into, into our data warehouse. We store 300 petabytes, and we crunch 10 petabytes for a day's worth of data analytics. Now, these are all large numbers, so let me put this in perspective. Let me try to put this in perspective. Imagine for a moment that these 300 petabytes were your HD video collection. And let's also imagine that you went home after F8 today and you said, I'm going to start watching this collection, and I'm going to stop when it all is done. You would still be watching your collection 3,000 years from today. That is the volume of data we are talking about. So given the size, we can no longer fit all this data in one data center. Our, our data infrastructure, our warehouse, has now gone global. We, the warehouse basically spans multiple data centers, but we still want to provide a global view, a, a logical view to the, to the users of our platform, to the product engineers and data analysts who use this platform. We do so by replicating data across these different data centers as needed to provide that logical view to our users. As the scale increased, some other changes happened as well. For one, we found that the open source systems that we had adopted and started to use at Facebook had to be evolved to run at our scale. As an example, we evolved Hadoop to Corona, which is a highly scalable version of Hadoop that we have run internally in our production clusters. We continue to push the boundaries of the stack, trying to find ways to evolve it to the next level of scale. Now, second, we found that we had gaps in our platform. We had specialized needs that Hadoop was not well suited for. For example, we found that we needed, likely needed specialized analytic engines for real-time graph and interactive analytics. As we started to solve these problems for Facebook, we, we, we continued to work very closely with the open source community, both by taking existing open source systems, such as Giraffe, and scaling them extensively to work at Facebook, as well as by building and open sourcing new analytic engines like Presto. So this is a map of our data infrastructure today. And as you can see, there are a lot more tools and systems than we started with back in 2007 and what we had in 2011. We won't have time to go into all of these systems today. There's a lot of systems. But we will deep dive into two systems, Giraffe, which we use for graph analytics at Facebook, and Presto, which we use for interactive analytics. As you can see, we are partnering closely with the open source community to push the boundaries of data infrastructure of these systems for the entire industry. We are very excited to share the technology behind these systems, but we are also very excited to be a part of this community, moving things forward for all of us. With that, I'd like to hand it off to Avery, who will deep dive into how we do graph analytics at Facebook using Giraffe. Thank you. Thank you, Sambhavi. I feel like with this microphone, I should start singing, but I will spare you from all of that. Don't worry. My name is Avery, and I've been working as an engineer in Facebook for three years on the data infrastructure team. And I'm here to talk about how we do large-scale graph analytics 
at Facebook with Apache Giraffe. So let's begin with Facebook. Facebook is a huge network of people, posts, groups, events, and many other entities. And we can think of this as a graph of vertices and edges. At its core, Facebook is comprised of people, which could be the vertices, and say friendships, which are the edges. And so graph analytics allows us a chance to look at insights into answering questions such as, given this social graph, and given what we know about their mutual friendships, could I suggest, for instance, that Jay and some of you might be friends? And I think they are, by the way. So I want to talk about three concrete use cases for how we use graph applications at Facebook. The first is in terms of ranking features. We've got lots of great products at Facebook, whether it's newsfeed, graph search, or trending topics. But their quality relies heavily on great, quality, great ranking features that are generated through graph analytics to make sure we can provide engaging and relevant content for everyone that comes to Facebook. The second use case is in terms of recommendations. Everyone, a lot of people come to Facebook looking for something, and we want to help them find it. There may be pages you may like or people you might know, as well as groups you, want to, you might want to join. We can use powerful algorithms such as collaborative filtering at large scale to be able to provide great quality recommendations for folks that are visiting our site. Finally, graph partitioning is an awesome problem that we get to solve at massive scale at Facebook. It has to do with the fact that we've got a huge social graph of entities. And we have this problem of how do we store these, these objects and entities across hundreds of machines in a way that optimizes for the access patterns that we have in our workload. So let's look at previous history. Graph processing is definitely not a new field. It's a very old one in computer science. And in the past, it's been studied on these benchmark graphs. If you look at the scale, the number of edges really spans up to about 6 billion edges. And there's been a lot of work in this, this area, and we've drawn a lot of inspiration from it. Now, the problem with this is that we can't directly apply it to our problems at Facebook. That's because social graphs are so much larger. Twitter's graph is estimated to be at about 50 billion edges, and Facebook's is, is well over the hundreds of billions of edges, which is orders of magnitude of what's been done in previous work. So this discrepancy between what's been done in the past and what we need at Facebook has really driven us to building new pieces of software that can work at our scale. And so that's where Apache Draft comes in. Apache Giraffe is an open source project we've been working on for the last two plus years, completely open with the community. All our changes go directly to Jira, they get reviewed by the open source uh, folks, and they're committed directly into the repository that's stored by Apache. We take that code and we put it, turn it into production directly at Facebook without any changes. It is a highly scalable open source graph processing engine where the model is to think like a vertex. You can imagine your vertex in the graph. You can do some computation. You can iterate over your messages. You can also send messages to other vertices in the graph. And the important thing is that Apache Giraffe solves all the hard problems of distributed computing for you, whether it's how to partition the data across hundreds of machines, coordinating that computation, as well as handling any kind of fault tolerance issues you might have. Here's how it fits in the stack. We've got storage. We've got execution APIs. We have applications and pipelines. And Giraffe sits at the level of applications along with Hive and Core Analytics that some of you mentioned earlier. The great thing about this is that we have one unique pipeline authoring framework where we can actually do data transformations with Hive as well as aggregations. And we can also integrate different kinds of graph applications like collected components or page rank calculations in the same framework, which makes it really great for our customers at Facebook. Here's how it works. I want to walk you through what we do with a specific application. First thing we need to do is load the graph into our, our hundreds of workers. We do this first by specifying an input format. The input format could be something like HBase tables, it could be Hadoop sequence files, and for us, it's actually Hive tables. We take that data and we partition it into a number of splits. Each worker is going to load up some number of splits into memory, and once it's all in memory, we can start the computation phase. We have a master process, which is going to assign which kind of computation to the workers to be done at this particular time whether it's the first stage of a k-means clustering application or a connected components application, this is where the master actually directs traffic on each iteration. Each of the workers will then take that computation and run it for every single vertex that they have on their, on their machine, as well as send messages as necessary. Once it's complete, 
We then continue the iterational process over and over again until we finish all of the application. This may take hundreds or thousands of iter iterations. Now finally, once all that's done, we take the data in memory on each worker, and we store it back to an output format. And for us, that's Hive tables. Now there are three major reasons why you want to build a graph processing engine specifically at Facebook, and I'll walk through each of them in detail. The first of which is API. I have an example here of PageRank. PageRank is an algorithm made very famous by Google's web search. And here's the implementation of PageRank in MapReduce or Hadoop. The first thing you'll notice is there's really lots and lots of lines of code. And that's because MapReduce is not optimized for doing graph computations. We needed an API that was actually conducive towards writing, making graph writing, uh, making writing graph applications very easy for every developer. And so if you look at the right side of the, the, the chart here, you see what it looks like an Apache Giraffe. Actually, PageRank is a really simple algorithm at its core. There's just two phases. From the first phase, we need to calculate the PageRank values from my neighbors. And the second phase, I want to be able to send PageRank values to my neighbors for that next calculation. Then we can iterate over and over again until our algorithm converges. Now, the second reason why we want to build a graph processing engine has to do with performance. Here's an example chart of a couple of applications that are implemented in both Giraffe as well as Hive and Hadoop. The first one to notice is PageRank. We're able to run a PageRank iteration with 400 billion edges on both Hive and Hadoop, and we see that the elapsed speedup is more than 100x. So this takes a computation that took hours and runs it in just minutes, which is really important for making these applications production ready at Facebook. The second application is a friends of friends score where we reach one degree and one hop into the network and do an infinity uh, calculation beyond our immediate neighborhood. And even though this is not an iterative application, we still see tremendous benefits with a framework like Apache Giraffe. Now, the final reason for why we need a graph processing engine, specifically at Facebook, is with, spe with respect to scalability. So here I have two charts I want to share with you with respect to draft scalability. On the left, we have scalability with respect to the number of workers. We fix our problem size at 200 billion edges, and we run one page rank iteration. And now we increase the number of workers from 50 to 300. The dotted line shows the ideal curve, what you would expect with the linear speedup. And we see giraffe clo closely follows that curve. And on the right graph, we see the scalability with respect to problem size, in this case, the number of edges. We fix the number of workers at 50, and we increase the problem size from 1 billion to 200 billion edges. And we see the draft still follows the ideal curve, which is great. But let's be honest. Billion edges isn't cool, right? You know what's cool? A trillion edges. And what we can do is actually have Giraffe run PageRank with a trillion social edges in less than three minutes per iteration with just 200 machines. That's a lot of zeros. So now that I've walked you through why we built Apache Giraffe with respect to its API, its scalability, as well as performance, I want to deep dive into three specific use cases more concretely. The first of which is ranking features. Some example of ranking features would be we want to be able to figure out how likely is it that people that come into Facebook are engineers or maybe perhaps spammers. spammers. And with this information, we can help tailor the content that we show you to be more relevant, as well as exclude spammers from our network. So here's an example of a couple of the products that actually leverage our ranking features, including ads, search, and site integrity. One of the ways we do this classification is through something we call clustering with k-means. Now, k-means is not a new algorithm by any means. It's definitely a really interesting, unsupervised machine learning algorithm for determining clusters organically. But it's never been applied at this scale of 1.4 billion people. I want to walk through actually how it works. So imagine there's these people in the graph, and we actually want to cluster them together. We can make this a very simple problem, a two-dimensional problem of distance. Think of this as a geographical map. And we want to actually find close people together geographically. The centroids represent center points for the cluster. So the first thing we'll do in our calculation is find the closest centroid to each person. So we do a distance calculation between each person to every single centroid here depicted. And the closest one becomes the one that I join as my cluster. This is a very expensive calculation. It's really the number of people times the number of centroids, which can be very large when we're talking about billions of people and millions of centroids, for instance. Now we have an initial clustering app. This is complete. But it's not good enough. We want to iterate and refine it. So the way we do this is by then updating the centroid locations to the actual centers of their clusters, their constituents. 
And after that, we rinse and repeat. We iterate again. We're going to do the assignment from each person to a centroid again. And it's going to continue a bit rapidly, more rapidly this time. And we see in this case, the last person actually switch clusters from red to yellow, and then update the centroids. K-Means has provided us a really powerful algorithm that works at scale for a variety of different products at Facebook. Now, the second case I want to go into is recommendation systems. Many of you Netflix. Oh, some of you have probably been watching this, the third season of House of Cards. I haven't yet. I've been working on this presentation. But um, we have a very similar problem to solve that Netflix does. And Netflix, Netflix's problem is how do we recommend great TV shows and great movies to show you based on your previous history of what you viewed and also what you rated? But you can think of that same problem in Facebook context. We have 1.4 billion people to make recommendations for, and we have lots of pages and lots of groups to suggest to you. So here I have a very simple example and some insights into how we do this. Take these two users, mine and Alec. Mine and Alec both like Disney as well as roller coasters. And we don't know anything about what Alec, Alec's preferences are towards Disneyland or Six Flags. But we can infer since these people have similar common interests, it might be a really good recommendation to actually recommend Disneyland and Six Flags as pages that Alec might like. So we take this and generalize it. We can say, given some historical preferences, we want to recommend items for everyone at Facebook. And one of the ways you can do this is through something called collaborative filtering. We have a very scalable implementation of collaborative filtering implemented at Facebook that is done through different methods, including matrix factorization, as well as item to item similarity. Now, of course, we're not the first ones to implement collaborative filtering. I want to present some results uh, where we compared to Spark. So Spark is a leading edge uh, machine learning platform that is very scalable as well in the open source community. Great project. Now, for in this case, we see that Giraffe compares quite favorably compared to Spark for their experience they ran at uh, medium to large scale. But unfortunately, this is not really good enough for us. Our production sizes are huge. We run at 100x this. We need to train on 100 billion plus recommendations and examples at our scale. And this is the tool that's actually powering pages you might like and groups you might want to join. Furthermore, we need to make it easy to use. So for all the commonly used applications we have at Facebook, we've actually turned those into single Python operators. What this means is that everyone at Facebook who's a developer can actually leverage these tools with just one line of code. One line for training, one line for recommendations, boom, you have a great recommendation for whatever product you have. The third application I want to talk about is data partitioning. So we have this problem of how do we distribute the social graph across hundreds and hundreds of machines at Facebook. So one easy way to do it is just say, hey, let's just put equal number of users in every machine. But that ignores the context of the social graph. And so for instance, if I have a query like refresh my newsfeed, I actually have to fetch all the data from all my friends, which means I have to hit a lot of machines in order to fetch this data just to, just to do that page refresh. So instead, what we want to do is something smarter about how we partition the data. We want to leverage optimized partitioning, how we optimize and partition graph data across these machines using balanced graph par uh, partitioning. Here's how we can do it. So rather than actually lay out these users just according to balance, we want to do it in a way that optimizes for the access patterns. So we have created an algorithm that iteratively improves the partitioning over, over each iteration until we end up at a convergence point. Here's some of our results. So on the left graph, what we've shown is how, as we continue to iterate, what's the improvement in terms of the edge locality, which is the number of local people on the same machine or partition for this particular um, iteration. And we can see that it really matters on how you start off with the partitioning. We can start off with a random partitioning where we just randomly assign people to every partition. This is bad. We can start off with actually geographical data, which actually starts off at a very pretty decent result at about 70% locality, and we refine that even further with our algorithm to about almost 80% plus. Now on the right graph, we show the number of vertices relocated per iteration. This is the number of vertices that are changing partition to partition uh, during the super step. And we can see that geo actually converges a lot faster as well. But this is all theoretical, right? Let's look at what happens in real production services. So when we deployed this in one caching service, we saw a cache hit rate increase from 70 to 85%. And more importantly, we saw the network traffic was reduced by 50%. That saves a lot of network traffic and a lot of money for Facebook. So just like Facebook, we're never really satisfied with what we're, we've done so far. We've got a lot of work to do. In terms of scalability, Facebook is continuing to grow in terms of people coming to the site as well as entities that we're tracking. And we've got to make sure that our framework scales with it. 
The second area is in terms of applications. We've got more than 30 plus applications in our internal suite, and they're leveraged across almost every major product group inside of Facebook. But we still think we're only starting to scratch the surface in this field. We've been working heavily on investing on distributed machine learning techniques, such as collaborative fil filtering and parallel boosting. And finally, we need to make sure that giraffe is our giraffe is continuing to run faster and faster in terms of performance. It's not enough that we are able to do these things at scale, but able to do them very efficiently so we can make for very efficient use of resources here at Facebook. And with this, I'll turn it over to Jay for his deep dive on Presto. Thank you, Avery. My name is Jay. I lead the Presto team at Facebook. Today, I'm going to talk about Presto. So what is Presto? Presto is a distributed query engine for big data. Well, there are a lot of databases out there. Some of these are open source. Some of these are commercial. They do a fine job. So what's different about Presto? Let's take a closer look. Presto itself is an open source it's query engines. It scales to petabytes worth of data. And Presto has a unique open connector architecture that allows Presto to talk to different data sources. And since we open sourced Presto about a year and a half ago, we've seen widespread adoption both within Facebook and outside in the community. Today, I'm going to start this talk, uh, give you a, a very brief high-level introduction of uh, Presto's architecture. I will spend a lot of time in this talk focusing on the use cases Presto is being used at Facebook uh, and talk about some of the open source community work we're doing to get more adoptions of folks outside of Facebook using Presto. So let's take a look. At the very high level, let's say you're a user you send a SQL query to a Presto coordinator. You can think of a coordinator as a brain. It takes a user input and parses the data and it divides up the work and it gives each worker a piece of the data. Every Presto worker node takes the input and reads the data from some storage system. Let's say in this case, some data sits on a disk. And each of the worker nodes will crunch the data process and provides its share of the data back to the coordinators. And the coordinator will send the answer back to the client. So it's, pretty, it's a pretty simple architecture. Okay. So let's take a look at the, how a SQL query engine will look like. On the left side, you'll see is a simple SQL query. Let's, maybe I should show this one. And the right hand side, I'll show the execution stages a simple SQL query will go through. Initially, we're reading from a user table. Well, a table scan operator and presto will read data from disk or whatever data source the data might be residing. Then we apply a filter. I only want active user from the last 30 days. Then I would like to group by or bucket the user into a different bucket based on the city the user lives in. I want to count how many users are in each city. Then I'll apply another filter. I only want cities whose user's population is greater than 1,000. Then I select the information I'm interested in send back to the user. Things like you know, the cities, the average age of my users. With this thing, not only doing this with a single node, we are doing this in a completely distributed fashion, meaning potentially hundreds of worker nodes are running at the same time to crunch through a massive amount of data to give the answer you're looking for. Presto has an open connector architecture. That's something very unique about Presto. Let's see that you send a query to a Presto, and you know some of your user data sits in a MySQL database. So Presto will go get data from MySQL. Let's say, give me back my user whose age are over 30. Then a lot of my raw, raw data or sits in a Hadoop cluster. I would like to get user information whose interaction with your organization is through the mobile channel. And you may be able to you know, get some information from some internal data sources. And the Presto is able to pull data from these different data sources join them together and give you an answer. So 
that particular architecture has certain advantages. One, you no longer have to prepare a central database or data warehouse to put information from different places. Two, it reduces the time to insight. You don't have to go through a nightly ETL process where you pull data from different data sources, refine them, and put them in a central locations. And also give you the additional flexibility to be able to connect Presto to some future data sources that you may not even have today. Next, I'm going to talk about some of the key use cases we've been using Presto at Facebook. As somebody has mentioned, at Facebook, we use Hadoop as the main data infrastructure to store and process the massive amount of data we have. We also use Hive as the key workhorse to process data from raw data to refine data ready for analytics. We build Presto to make sure that users who are using Presto to answer that can get a very good user experience, and the answer comes back in a very short period of time. So Presto is used for Hive Warehouse interactive analytics. Let's, see, let's look at some of the numbers, you know. So if you look at these numbers, these are just some random numbers. So let's look at, OK, so we have some small numbers to some very large numbers. So you might have guessed these numbers have something to do with the Presto cluster stats. Let's take a closer look. Today, we run double-digit number of Presto clusters in productions. These clusters are used by thousands of Facebook employees every month doing analytics. And collectively, they perform millions of queries every month and process many, many petabytes worth of data. To put this in perspective, that's equivalent of multiple quadrillion number of rows per month. Up until I started working Facebook, I never have a need to use a number bigger than a trillion. So to put this into perspective, what is one quadrillion rows? So if we imagine a single row is a penny, and you stack together a quadrillion number of pennies, how long would that be? That's long enough to go around the Earth 25,000 times. That is the data scale we're working at Facebook. And luckily, we have a very nice infrastructure like Presto to help us to process that kind of massive amount of data. Another use case we use Presto for is mobile analytics. As many of you may have attended you know, Parse talk in the, in the last, year, last day, day or so, Parse is a mobile app platform. It allows you to quickly to build a mobile applications. As a mobile app developer, you would like to know how many active users I have today versus last week or maybe last month. I would like to know what kind of phone they run my apps on, what kind of device they have, and where they live. I would like to know the application usage and maybe if they crash, how often they crash, and what kind of device they don't work as well. To answer these kind of questions, we need a mobile analytics engine. It needs to be highly robust. This is being a user-facing application, and it needs to work. It needs to be super fast. You know, response comes back in a few seconds or less time. Again, it needs to be able to scale to handle the huge amount of data we have at Facebook. And it needs to be highly reliable in the sense that if something were to happen to part of your backend system, it needs to be instantly fail over to another site, so it's highly available to the user. So we have chosen using Presto to sit on top of Shard of MySQL as a combination to be able to support mobile analytics. As many of you might know that Facebook it was built on MySQL. It is today runs on MySQL today. And we have over a decade of experience optimized and hardening MySQL in our production environments. So the combination of Presto and MySQL form an ideal tool to be able to tackle the mobile analytics problem. So let's take a look. In this case, you may see that there are three MySQL servers. On each server, I further partition and divide my data into multiple shards. And I have a query, select star from my table. 
meaning I want to read from every single row from my table and then return the data to the end user. In this case, Presto will do a full scan, reading concurrently from nine shards at the same time. Say, what happens if I add a filter condition? Say, I only want row whose my column value equals to five. Presto, in this case, will do two optimizations. First, it will say that, oh, based on my partition strategy, I know that only shard number two can possibly contain the answer I need. So what Presto will only read from shard two. Then Presto will push the filter to shard number two. As MySQL is a smart storage engine, it will perform the evaluation within the MySQL database, only sends the minimum amount of data back to Presto, therefore improve performance. Next, I'm going to talk about, you know, when we build Presto from the very beginning, we, will, we know that we want to open source this product and then build a strong community to use the product and contribute back to the product. Today, we develop Presto completely on GitHub. What does that mean? That means anytime we commit a change on GitHub, the external community see the change right away. Last week, we held a Presto meetup at Facebook, you know, and uh, one of the engineers came to me to say that, do you have some special version of Presto, you know, like, you know, specifically for Facebook that's different from what's available in the open source community? The answer to that question is no. Everything we do is completely open. It gets committed to GitHub right away. So whatever we use, run at Facebook, is whatever is you see on GitHub. A lot of you use Presto as a way to accelerate analytics on Hadoop. So we built out of box integration with the popular Hadoop distribution. So today, every time we do a Presto release, we make sure it integrates well with Hadoop 1.x and the 2.x releases, and also works well with the Cloudera distribution of Hadoop. And since we open source Hadoop, we've seen an adoption of Presto by some of the you know, leading technology companies in Silicon Valley. In that respect, it's kind of similar to some of the other popular open source projects like uh, Apache Hadoop that gets adopted by firms in the valley then to spread throughout the industry. Luckily, we also seen some of the companies offering Presto as a service. Kubely and Treasure Data are two big data, you know, big data cloud service providers. And we're also having Presto running on AWS, supporting many important customers. We have, uh, as we start to engage the community, we answer questions on the Presto user groups, or sometimes we email, communicate with the a particular community members directly. Just like Facebook, we've seen Presto's adoption has been spread worldwide, and Presto has been adopted by pretty much every major economy of the world today. Not only we're seeing more adoption of Presto, we're seeing more community contribution, meaning organizations and engineers contributing back into Presto that work with the Facebook team to make Presto a better product. Let's take a look at some of the stats. In the second half of last year, we see more than 90 plus pull requests or patches that are fixing bugs in Presto or adding small enhancement. The community has also added you know, connectors to three very important Presto data sources, Cassandra, Postgres, and Kafka. The community has also added integration between Presto and Parquet, which is a columnar storage format that's pretty popular to store data on Hadoop. And we have added date support. So you're looking at all the changes, all the contributions the community has been made back to Presto. We're really happy that not only we're seeing more contribution, these contributions actually touch different part of Presto. So it's our hope and it's our aspiration to continue to work and engage with the community to make Presto better. Going forward, we're going to focus on security integration. As Presto starts to take on more mission-critical workloads, you know, you may put putting sensitive financial data on Presto. We want to make sure it's secure. Only the right people is allowed to use Presto to interact with the data. And we also see more and more users to use Presto to learn larger queries. 
obviously a Presto query that reads 10 gigabytes of data will require a different amount of resource than a Presto query that reads through a petabyte worth of data. Obviously, a better resource management is necessary to make sure that all these users have a good user experience. Presto, from the very beginning, is an NC SQL compliant query engine. We would like to make sure that we continue to add in additional SQL features to make it very convenient for developers to use Presto. Last, we've seen that there are more and more OLAP workloads being used with Presto. So what is an OLAP workload? It's your standard slice and dice and queries to see that I am as a mobile developer. I look to know how many users are using my mobile applications. I would know their demographics based on the OS, the device they use, and based on the demographics. And when I ask the question with a different combination of these kind of criteria, these are kind of OLAP workload. We want to make sure that Presto is getting better at supporting them. We all know that we live in an era of big data. Every organization is getting a huge amount of data. It's our goal to make Presto be able to better scale to support this massive amount of data and to give you an answer at the speed of a rocket. Thank you.